We're actually live. For some reason, the practice session didn't work. I'm not sure why. Our uh, tonight's webinar is our spring 2020 financial aid uh, uh, information workshop. Um, I'll be covering a variety of things in uh, this workshop. The um, uh, thing I want to do is just give a few instructions on how I hope to proceed here. First is I'll be taking questions to the Q&A option. Uh, that should be showing up on the bottom of your screen where you can click and answer the ask questions. Uh, we do have the upvote uh, initiated on the Q&A. So if there are questions that people who are uh, watching uh, would like to, to push forward, then we can do uh, that with the Q&A. Also, uh, I want to introduce Isabel Moreno. She is our Associate Director for Admissions and Financial Aid here at the Quinney College of Law. She is on the participant list and will be posting web addresses and answering questions in the chat box on the, uh, on the webinar page. So feel free to, uh, to either talk with her, talk amongst each other, or, or ask her questions specifically. Um, I'll try to answer questions as we move along. If it looks like we're not gonna get through all of this in time, then what I'll do is I'll just hold off until I'm completed with a section and answer the questions that I see in the q and I'm gonna move over to uh, share my screen here so that you guys have access to the PowerPoints. Um, know that uh, with the login or the registration that, and you provided your email address, I'll send you the slide deck uh, in a couple of days, along with an application fee waiver uh, that I'll talk about in a minute. The uh, contact information you see on the screen right now is my direct contact at the law school. Um, actually, there's my office line. Uh, I've got the voicemail forwarded, but the, not the, the ring. So you'll get my voicemail if you call that number. Feel free to call me on my cell. That number is 801-913-9055. Isabel, feel free to put that on the chat if you like. Uh, so we are working remotely here at the University of Utah uh, as a response to the, the COVID uh, pandemic. And so the best way to get a hold of me by phone is on that phone number or the email you see on your screen. So I want to talk before we get into the content of this about some future events. Just want to let you know that uh, presuming that we are going to proceed as normal in fall, I uh, would encourage you to visit the law school and get a tour of the building and sit in on a class. I think that's one of the best things you can do uh, from a financial standpoint in making an informed decision about what law school is gonna be the best fit for you or what law school is like. Uh, we'll have those visits and school tours available beginning on uh, September 7th and that'll run through the Friday before the week of Thanksgiving. Uh, our fall break is, uh, it's uh, for obvious reasons, not going to be available for tours or class visits. Uh, our financial aid workshops, the live workshops, will be um, occurring in September. We'll post those dates in July. Um, those will be uh, recorded and posted to our website. But um, uh, Isabel and I have been talking about the success of these events, and so we're actually contemplating putting on a series of these webinars uh, so folks don't have to travel, or folks who would have to otherwise travel a long distance to attend these will have access to the information. So keep abreast of that. Uh, law school fairs here at the University of Utah and BYU, two of the schools that have the largest applicant pools in the state of Utah, will be happening in October. Those are the dates. Uh, also, I'll let you know that for those of you who are local in particular, uh, the University of Utah Continuing Ed Program does have uh, prep, LSAT prep courses. Um, I think they are still working out how the online approach to those classes will be uh, administered. Uh, the dates for the courses are listed there and also registration information. The um, uh, last hot link or, or link that you see there is for a prep course drawing. So if you click that link and uh, register, you'll be, your name will be included for a drawing for a free LSAT prep course. And it, if it ends up being an online course, even those of you who are outside of Salt Lake will be eligible to sign up for that. So feel free to, to sign up for that um, drawing. Other events, uh, for those nationally, uh, and then, uh, or who will be traveling perhaps around the country or in different places during the fall, these are law school admission council law forum events. 
Um, uh, currently, their July 18th Washington DC forum, I believe is still scheduled, but I think it is susceptible to being canceled uh, in response to the COVID um, uh, pandemic. So keep abreast of the LSAC website. Those other events uh, will be happening throughout the fall. So those can be really helpful in learning about law schools. And each of those events actually has a financial aid information workshop, a live workshop that can uh, be very helpful also, as well as workshops on the application process, uh, personal statements, letters of recommendation, those sorts of things. Another event that, or series of events that are coming up that uh, we have found very informative and helpful to students are um, Managing Your Money During the COVID-2019 Pandemic webinar sponsored by Access Lex. It's a nonprofit organization that focuses on student information, uh, debt management, uh, repayment strategies, and in this case, uh, providing information uh, in a wide array of areas, including health, the economy, and student loans. So if you're not quite sure if you're a student who's going to be graduating recently in the near future and what that means for your student loan repayment, this would be a very helpful um, webinar to attend. Uh, Access Lex does a great deal of um, good service and in virtually every case it's free for students. So I'd get on their website and get into their information channel and try to attend one of these webinars. Isabel attended uh, one a couple of days ago. She was really impressed with it. And then um, now uh, getting into the, the content of our um, web uh, webinar today. Uh, I always encourage people to look at funding their law school experience as a lifetime investment. What you're going to be doing as you go through law school is setting yourself up professionally for a career that's going to last a lifetime. And I think in contemplating how you're going to cover the costs of law school, it's best to approach that um, thinking with an investment um, thought in mind. And uh, with that said, I want to acknowledge a couple of things. One is uh, common investment in disclosures. And I think uh, the, the times we are in really exemplify this. Uh, past performance is no guarantee of future results. That is, um, there's going to be a lot of information I'm going to provide to you today statistically about what uh, trends are going, what, where the trends are with hiring up to this point, salaries, average debt, tuition, things like that. Uh, but the trends don't always speak to future results. It's helpful information, but just know that when you graduate from law school and you start your career, and hopefully you will begin thinking early in that career about investing and preparing for retirement, one of the first things that person who is providing financial advice to you should be acknowledging is that um, there is no guarantees in kind of this investment uh, approach to life, uh, that uh, you can get some data out there um, but past performance is no guarantee of future results. And that goes both ways in terms of it can perform stronger or it may perform more weakly. Um, I also want to, the second thing I want to acknowledge is a couple of statements by Warren Buffett. Um, the Oracle of Omaha, I believe, as he's referred to. Uh, he, the quote that you see on your screen, the middle one, be fearful when others are bold and bold when others are fearful, is a quote he made and actually the bracketed words, bold, uh, the actual words in his quote are greedy. Uh, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. And what he was talking about there was a time in the early 2000s when the stock market uh, it was um, creating a bubble that he was concerned about it getting ready to burst. And that bubble and that growth in the market was driven a lot by others who were seeking to be greedy but making uninformed decisions about the market. And so even though the market was expanding at, at a terrific rate and it looked like all things were going well, um, he was fearful uh, and, and that fear was driven by the other's greed making kind of uninformed or, or in some cases irrational decisions on investments and where to invest. And so those were times when he was fearful. But then conversely, he talked about how he was bold or willing to be greedy when others are fearful because he saw that as an opportunity for um, good investments to be made, that, that stocks are underselling or underpriced in, in those experiences. I think that relates to kind of where we are in the application process right now. 
any of you have spent any time online in looking about the law school experience in the last three or four years, um, what you'll notice is that we're still in a recovery phase from the Great Recession in law school application numbers. That is in about 2010, when was the last peak of the law school applicant pool, that was the largest numbers of applicants were in the pool at that time, there was over 90,000 people applying to law school. And, and there was just over 50,000 seats that they were vying for. So it was a highly competitive environment and times were difficult for people in terms of trying to get into law school. Um, since that time, since the Great Recession hit, the number of people applying to law school has dropped significantly and, and we haven't seen much of a recovery in that. So, uh, you know, it was upwards of 93, 90,000, 94,000 applicants in 2010. Applicants now are, are barely around 50,000. Um, and what schools have done to respond to that is they've, they've reduced their class sizes, so they're not trying to fill 50,000 seats. But nevertheless, what you'll find as applicants that you're gonna have opportunities available to you in law school um, and admissions to law schools that had you been applying five, 10 years ago, um, or 10 years ago or more, it, it would have been very difficult to gain admission. So you'll have opportunities because others are still being fearful in this process. But the last thing I want to point to in this slide is the fact that you shouldn't act um, irrationally. You shouldn't just jump into the pool, as it were, um, without thinking this through very carefully. You need uh, you can't act on this without uh, giving very serious thought as to whether this is a good decision for you and choosing to attend law school, both academically as well as professionally, but also um, financially. As you contemplate law school being a lifetime investment, um, you need to approach it with what you would be doing in a retirement investment. You need to do your research. You need to develop a strategy and you need to look at resource acquisition in terms of how you're going to pay for it. And then you have to think about how are you going to allocate the resources you acquire in paying for law school to make sure those resources are going to pay the greatest dividend to you or going to have the most positive impact for you. As you think about those things, um, I want you to consider a couple of things that um, you should be weighing now. The first is determining your risk or debt aversion. For those of you who are looking at applying to law school uh, and wanting to law, start law school in um, 2021, in, in 21 next fall, I want you to come up with your debt aversion number in October around Halloween. Before Halloween comes, you should be thinking, you should have a number in your mind that when you finish up law school, or for those of you who are finishing up your undergraduate experience, you should have already received a notification that you'll have to do an exit counseling. In law school, the exit counseling will involve sitting down with a financial aid office person or having an online experience. And as part of that, you will be informed how much money you have borrowed during your time in law school in the form of student loans. Your debt aversion number is the number in which you don't want to hear in that meeting. It's the number that, it's, it's the amount of debt you don't want to have as you go through, after you go through law school. And that's a very personal choice. For some people, it may be, you know, a large number. Uh, what I see is a large number, $200,000 or more. Some people would say, I'm comfortable with that kind of educational debt. Others may have high debt aversion and would be very uncomfortable if they had $20,000 of debt at, at graduation from law school. Whatever your choices in making that or identifying that number, you need to identify what that is before you start hearing from schools and having offers of admission made to you. And the reason is, if you know what that number is, um, it'll give you the opportunity to think about um, the impact of student debt as you select which law school you're going to accept the offer of admission from. Because in April, or spring of that admission cycle, you're going to need to make commitments to the schools about your intent to enroll in their programs. And uh, I, one of the things I will show you in this workshop is how to calculate what the debt likely debt will be um, uh, once you have that school's information. And if that number, as you project um, the kind of debt you would have, is higher than your debt aversion number for a school you're very interested in attending, you need to know if you accept their offer of admission, you may be making a decision that um, goes against what you were thinking earlier about the kind of debt you're comfortable with. And I'm not saying you shouldn't 
accept that offer of admission. That's a decision for you to make. But making that decision from an informed standpoint is an ex extremely important part of this process when you look at it as an investment approach. And then finally from this page, you need to do your due diligence. Um, that's part of what that campus visit that I mentioned uh, earlier about. That you, your, the words due diligence are uh, what they call a term of art in, um, in the practice of law, especially in the area of mergers and acquisitions. When you have one company acquiring another company, purchasing another company, there's a part of that process when the deal was about to be completed where they say, all right, we're gonna enter due diligence. And that's the part of the process where the company doing the purchasing um, goes to the company that they're about to buy and says, all right, I need you to open the books. Uh, we're gonna have our lawyers and accountants go over to the building and you're gonna show us what kind of debt you actually have. You're gonna show us if you're vulnerable to any litigation. You're gonna look at the, you know, the, the kind of HR issues that may be uh, facing uh, from, from the standpoint of purchasing a company and purchasing problems potentially, as well as the assets. Um, so you need to do your due diligence in this admissions process so you know what you're getting into um, in your experience for law school from the standpoint of the academic experience you're going to have, uh, the financial costs that you're going to incur, and your potential employment outcomes uh, that you hope to have uh, when the whole process is done. And hopefully this workshop will help you in doing your due diligence. So as part of it, I mentioned that you have to do your research. Here's some data trends. Um, for uh, law school tuition, uh, here's the last three years of uh, tuition. Um, I don't have the 2019, 2020 data up yet, um, but as you can see, as is the case most of the time, um, tuition goes up. Uh, nationally speaking, the national average tuition for students who are residents at state supported schools in 2018-19 uh, was a little over $27,000 a year. For non-residents, that was $40,000 a year. And at private schools, uh, that tuition was about $47,000 a year. Um, that cost um, is, is traditionally going up and kind of the reality of where we are today is um, if we hit a pretty difficult recession coming out of this COVID uh, response, um, a lot of what happened in the last time we were in recession that is that there was a there was a bigger jump in tuition costs because institutions were having to uh, pass the cost on to the students because tax revenues were down at state ins at the states where state schools were located and so those tax revenues weren't able to support the universities in the way they had in the past and in private schools they support themselves with investments and endowments and if the stock market is down those those endowments aren't generating as much income for the schools. And so that trickles down to the people who are attending. So um, keep an eye out for that. Um, oh, I'm sorry, this is the updated data. Uh, so for the 18-19 school year, it was um, 28 and 41 and 49 respectively. For law school debt trends, um, uh, so, uh, and since 2014, as you can see, law school debt has uh, generally gone up, but there was a year where there was a slight decline and it seems to be um, uh, trending downward. Uh, I want to say this is one of the more frustrating statistics uh, for me, and I'll explain why in just a moment. But as you can see, uh, graduates of private schools, the national average debt uh, for the class of 2018 was uh, nearly $24,000. And for the class of 2018 at public schools, the average debt was nearly $87,000. In the parentheticals, you'll see that's the percentage of students who borrowed nationally. So 75% of law school graduates in 2018 had some kind of debt, and that average debt was $86,850. If you look from the previous year, it's a slight decline in the percentage of debt as well as the numbers. The, the, the challenge that I have with this data, if you look at the source, U.S. News and World Report, most of the data that I am providing to you in this series of slides comes from the American Bar Association. The American Bar Association is not the accrediting agency for law schools. So they are required to provide accurate data uh, in the format that the ABA requires it to be presented to them and presented to the public. And if they don't do it right, um, schools are, you know, subjecting their accreditation to being lost or um, uh, having sanctions. And so there are 
real incentives for schools to make sure they're right on that information. U.S. News and World Report, while it's a ranking organization, isn't an accrediting agency. And so as a result of that, um, one of the things that has um, occurred is uh, the ABA has stopped collecting student debt data in the way that U.S. News collects it. It used to collect it as aggregates. They'd say for the people who just graduated from law schools, what was their average debt in your school? And now they're just asking for annual debt of all students, how much borrowing occurred at a school in, any, in, in that particular year. And so that's not representative of peop what people are graduating with in debt. And so since the US News and World Report is the only organization that collects the data, um, the reliance we have on the accuracy of that data is slightly diminished. Um, uh, and so for the data that you actually see there for the class of 2018, I think there were 16 law schools that simply chose not to report the data. And of those that did report data, there's no verification method uh, with enforcement associated with it. With that acknowledgement, the trends make sense to me and the amounts are still in the ballpark that I think make some sense for student debt. So there's some reliance, there's you know more than um, just nominal reliance you can put on the numbers, but just realize where the numbers are coming from um, in representing the kind of debt that students have. One of the reasons I also put this slide up a little bit later in the process goes to my suggestion that you have a debt aversion number by Halloween of your application year. Uh, I wanted you to think about a number for a little bit before I showed you this data so you have a sense of whether or not you are in the ballpark for what's going on nationally on average. And if you're someone who is way below those numbers or way higher than those numbers, thinking about how that relates to um, why you felt comfortable with the numbers that you came up with and considering whether you may need to make some adjustments or get more information about how these numbers are generated um, to match what your interests or concerns are as it relates to law school debt. Salary trends. These are um, the dividends of your law school experience. That is, uh, you're investing in law school and time and money with tuition and, and, and the time that you're in school and the effort that you're putting in. And right after graduation, uh, that first year of salary you earn is going to be the first indication of the dividends that you'll be reaping from your investment in law school. I want to acknowledge a couple of things as it relates to this data, though. This data just relates to the first year salaries for graduates from law school. So the graduates from the class of 2018, this is the salary they earned to start. It's not representing the salaries these people will be earning five years after graduation or even the areas they may be working in. People move uh, in diff around different areas of law. And I think uh, the last data I looked at, it's expected that a person who practices or is in law will change jobs an average of seven times in, in their, their career lifespan. So uh, these numbers will be changing over time. Um, and it's likely that they will, over the long term, go up. Uh, so as you contemplate data, I always encourage people not to, while they should take into consideration uh, what the numbers are looking at at graduation, just to be both realistic and understand what the expectations are coming out of school. Uh, also anticipate that these numbers should be going up as the economy goes up or improves, or as your um, professional skills develop and you get a better reputation and you're hiring or bringing on more clients. So realize that. Now, in this, this employment, the, the median salary and the distribution of by employer types represents a number of things. Uh, this number, 89.4%, uh, is the number of people who were employed coming out of uh, 10 months out of law school for the class of 2018. That, re that number represents all types of employment, whether it's somebody who's working in a big law in New York City or as a solo practitioner in Ames, Iowa, um, or in a burger bar, right? So um, for people who are wanting to be practitioners in law, be licensed attorney representing clients, this is a number that's going to be very important in the data that exists. The people who have employment in areas that have bar passage required. And that number for the class of 2018 was 72.8%. Um, that's been an improvement since we were just five years out in 2015 from the Great Recession really hitting hard. And it was 66%. Um, so we've seen a steady climb in the improvement over uh, this time period of, of the economy and where people are getting jobs. Also realize what you're looking at. If you're somebody who's going to law school because you value the skills development and training that you'll get, but you're not necessarily committed to the idea of practicing, 
um, you know, this statistic may not mean as much to you as say the areas of employment where some of these people may be working. And so for all types of employment, everybody who had a job uh, in 2018, 10 months after graduation, the national median was $71,500 roughly. And here, a steady increase over uh, the last five or so years. For people who went to work in education, that is basically anywhere on a university campus, not just as professors or jobs like mine as, a, as an assistant dean of admissions, but perhaps people who worked in the contracting office or an HR, um, general counsel's office. Uh, these are both bar passage required and non-bar passage required jobs. Uh, under 2% of law school graduates went into that field, which is, you know, it, it coincides with the, where the trends are and in fact is a slight decline uh, from where it was in 2015. Uh, the national median salary is uh, just over $51,000. For those who are working in the business sector, uh, corporations, any business part of the business sector, private sector. Uh, so this includes jobs like the general counsel's office of a company, but kind of like what I just said with education. It can also include people who are working in the contracting office or human resources. Or what we're seeing is more and more lawyers going to work in um, industries that are highly regulated and working in the compliance office to make sure that uh, whatever company they're working for, if they're highly regulated, that they're following the regulatory rules and, and statutes that relate to whatever the business is in. Um, uh, about 13% of the graduates went into that field and that uh, national median salary was around $70,000 a year. Then judicial clerkships. It always hovers around that 10% mark. Uh, these are highly competitive jobs, especially at the federal level. They are state jobs. Um, they're basically working for a judge in, in his or her chambers, um, helping with the drafting of bench briefs, uh, helping with the drafting of opinions, things like that. Um, while the jobs don't pay much to start, these often serve as great springboards and are considered prestigious so they can be helpful in the private sector if you're looking at going into private practice. Firms actually like to see their young associates do this kind of work because one, it looks good on the firm's um, website to have people who have done these kinds of clerkships. And two, um, it's always helpful in a firm if you have somebody who's worked for the judge in the past and they know that judges uh, tendencies and, and the kinds of arguments they appreciate, things like that. So this is part of that investment approach. While the salary may not pay a lot right out of law school, the benefits that you can reap from that position years down the road can pay off in, in larger amounts. Then government work, any kind of government work, a U.S. attorney, attorney general, um, the division of environmental quality is the attorney for that particular division, things like that. 12% of graduates went into government work. Uh, this includes district attorney's offices and things of that nature. Then there's private practice. 50, almost 55% of law school graduates went into that area. Um, one of the things I um, always highlight is the fact that it's traditionally in this kind of 53, maybe 56% of uh, the graduates going into this field. I think based on popular culture and media, you would suspect that actually it would be a higher percentage, but in fact, it's just over half of law school graduates go into that field. It does happen to be the most lucrative area though. Uh, the median salary uh, for 2018 was $120,000 to start. So the highest salaries uh, were in the 190,000 range in the major markets at the biggest firms in those markets like New York, Washington, San Francisco, Chicago. And then public interest. Um, that I think is one of the most important areas of law, but unfortunately and unfairly, it's also one of the lowest paid. Median salaries start to start are in the $50,000 range. About 7% of law school graduates go to work in that field. To further dissect the employment trends over uh, the last 10 years, though, I want to show, and it's helpful to look at this because where we are right now and facing a recession, uh, you're going to see where kind of behaviors changed through the recession, the Great Recession. So in 2018, for example, private law firm practice, uh, 2018, 55% of graduates were in this field. And so um, prior to the Great Recession really hitting hard, it was about 56% of law school graduates went into private practice. But in the depths of the recession, this is where the biggest hits in the recession occurred. And in 2011, less than half of the graduates were working in the private sector because they had cut back so much. So keep that in mind. Um, where did some of those people go? Well, they, we started seeing them go into um, a little bit into government work. You saw the percentages slightly climb there, but business picked up a big part of the graduate pool. So prior to the recession hitting, 
uh, under 14% of people were going into the area of business, uh, working in businesses, but that climbed up to, to 18% and held steady for a couple of years in that area. So in, in being more entrepreneurial in the job search, I think this is where law school graduates, uh, one of the areas that law school graduates turn to. Another area they turned to actually was public interest. And I think there was a couple of reasons there. One is there were some jobs there. Um, and, and secondly, uh, with the public service loan forgiveness, as people thought about opportunities and having income sensitive repayment options, this was the kind of job sector where people could afford to work. And if there were jobs there, they're more willing to take them. And so that's where we saw some more people increasing. One of the interesting things is while there were drops in other areas like business, where it dropped down to 12, 13% after the recovery occurred, but people stayed in that 7% range in public interest. I think that's an indication of people enjoying the work in the field. And then education, there was a slight drop there. Uh, from, from the, the, the time in the recession. So salaries, um, in terms of the salaries, I also wanna make sure that you have full disclosure and have an understanding that while salaries in general, the median is higher or is the highest nationally, there is a spectrum of salaries in the private sector. You should be aware of that. In the private sector, uh, salaries range from, as I mentioned, um, the median salary by firm size from the high end of 190 to where you have very small firms of one to 10 people, it's in that $60,000 range, which is commensurate with a lot of the other sectors that we were talking about. Um, and where you tend to see the biggest jumps is between firms in size of 100 and larger, jumps from 86 to 120,000 in terms of the medians. Um, I'd like to juxtapose that information with the distribution of people working in these fields. If you look at people who are working in firms of um, uh, 50 or less attorneys, that makes uh, 33, 43, uh, 52%. So over half of the people who are working in private sector law firms um, are in this 50 to or, or smaller firm size. And these firms are in the salary range of 60 to $80,000. And so I think it's important for you to be uh, knowledgeable about that particular statistic. So you're making informed decisions and you have an understanding of what your expectations should be as you contemplate what part of the market you're looking at. The last thing I want to show you in the research um, is uh, what's called the bimodal draft, uh, bimodal graph in the distribution of salaries for attorneys. This is one of the only markets um, by, by, uh, by job classification, where this is the shape of the curve of salaries. Uh, most of the time you'll have a traditionally shaped bell curve with the apex of the curve being the highest point, and that coincides with what the average and the median salaries are very close. When I hear somebody mention something about the average, I, su I suspect that that represents the highest frequency of those numbers. So in a traditional bell-shaped curve, this would be where the apex of the curve is. In law, it's actually where there's a trough. You have a bimodal graph, you have a peak here and a peak here. Another way they refer to this is also an inverted graph where you have, it's the traditional, uh, it's in the invert of the, the traditional bell-shaped curve. And so even though we were talking about medians in that 70 to $80,000 range, actually the frequency of people who are making those numbers is fairly low. That where the largest numbers of people earning the particular salaries are located, are in this kind of fifty to sixty thousand dollar range, and then in the higher ranges of the public sector at the largest firms. So it splits that that graph apart. So I think it's important to be knowledgeable about this information. Uh, the vast majority of the information I provided to you was from the um, ABA's uh, website. Uh, schools are required to report their data that they uh, that they generate annually to show that they're meeting accreditation standards. And we report that data in what are called 509 reports, standard 509. And if you just do a Google search for disclosures, law school disclosures, it'll bring you to this website. Um, it's a really helpful website. You can look up the data by school where I, um, I showed you some of it, or you can get aggregate data that, you know, if you wanna look at the tuition rates for all law schools in the United States for the year 2016, it'll give you a spreadsheet with all the schools listed and just that particular area or set of data. So it can be very helpful in getting information as you make your decisions or as you try to do the research to make informed decisions in this admissions process.
Okay, so there's the, uh, the, the research uh, that I've done for you, so you're welcome. Um, so now where, where are we? Well, it's, what, do we, what do we mean by financing law school? You've got all this data that you can point to, but what does it really mean? Well, I think it's data that you need to use as you consider meeting all the costs associated with all aspects of your legal education process. And the, the main components of those are the application phase, the enrollment phase, and the licensing phase. For those of you who have paid for an LSAT already, you understand that the cost of applying to law school uh, it quickly adds up and it can be an expensive process. Enrollment uh, kind of speaks for itself. I, you've seen the numbers and I'm guessing there's, there weren't too many surprises. Um, and so you know it's going to be an expensive experience. At this stage of the process, sometimes people are surprised that I list licensing in there. But licensing is kind of like the application phase of law school. It, it's, it can be an expensive uh, prospect if you're not ready for it. So I'll spend part of my um, um, presentation talking about meeting the expenses associated with that. And it's important to know because uh, for those of you who are interested in going into governmental work or in the public interest with nonprofit organizations, know that when you graduate from law school, you're not a licensed attorney. You have a diploma that serves as your ticket to sit for the bar exam. The bar exam is administered twice a year in July and in February. When you graduate in May or June, you'll spend uh, that time between graduation and the bar studying for the bar, and then you have to wait for the results. And you're not licensed until you're sworn in. That matters because in organizations like U.S. Attorney's Office or Attorney General's Office or nonprofit organizations, when they have job announcements for attorneys, typically the last sentence in the job announcement will say the person hired for this job must be licensed in this jurisdiction. And if you live in a jurisdiction like Utah, uh, once you pass the bar, the swearing in ceremony will be that first week of October. So, you know, that's not too far off from graduation, you know, it's five or so months afterwards. But in jurisdictions where there are large numbers of applicants like California, New York, or Texas, it takes a while to, to um, um, grade all those exams. And so people aren't informed of having passed the exam until November. So think about it. You finished law school in May, you sit for the bar exam in July, and then you don't get notified that you've passed it until November. The other thing about these large jurisdictions is um, the fact that since so many people are sitting for the bar, they don't want to waste their time doing the character and fitness check on all the applicants. What they do is they wait to say who has passed the bar and then just do the character and fitness check on those people. And so from the time you know you are notified that you passed the bar, there's this uh, about two month period through the end of December where there's the character and fitness check and then the swearing in ceremonies occur in January. So if you're applying for one of those jobs in, in the government or uh, public interest, you're not able to earn an attorney's uh, salary or in some cases be hired as an attorney until you've been licensed and sworn in in January, the year after you graduate. So that's why it's an important element of figuring out what these costs that are going to be associated with all of your legal education. So the second element of uh, that plan, um, strategy, have sound budgeting habits. It's important now to make sure that you've developed sound budgeting habits. And it sounds um, almost patronizing for me to say that, but it matters and it matters in this way. Um, in terms of your credit history, if you're one of those people who just kind of lives on your debit card and sometimes you're overdrawn and you're not, and sometimes you're late on your, your credit card payments, um, and it hits your FICA score a little bit, but it doesn't kill you, um, realize this, that part of the character and fitness check that you will go through as, as an attorney uh, will it involve you releasing financial information to the bar examiners because as an attorney, you're going to be uniquely situated as a professional in the United States uh, and, in, and, and, and um, the only profession where you will have basically check writing authority for the clients who give it to you. You will be trustees for some of the trusts that are set up by your clients or foundations that you represent. Um, you will be handling um, client money in the way of retainers. Retainers aren't pay. Retainers are money clients will give you in anticipation of you doing work for them. But that money is not yours until you've earned it and you have to account for it. So you have these accounts set up for retainers fees. You have this access to the checkbooks for the foundations and the trust that you work on. And what the bar examiners are concerned with is if you have a pattern of behavior of not being good with your own funds, 
then it suggests that there may be a temptation that if you're not able to make payroll or if you have a really uh, outstanding amount of debt, whether it's credit card debt or student loan debt, you'll be tempted at times to use client funds to carry you through times in which perhaps you don't have all the funds necessary to make that payroll or what have you. And so that's why as part of the character and fitness check, you're going to look at your financial situation to see basically whether you're a risk to clients in the future based on um, your patterns of behavior and how you handle money. So that's one of the biggest reasons why it's important for you to make sure you have good budgeting and, and, and financial practices um, that, so that that doesn't get you into trouble come time to go through your character and fitness check with the VAR. Um, another budgeting tip. Uh, this is kind of a personal uh, story in terms of uh, my, you know, I did not come from a family of wealth by any means. My mom was a school teacher. Uh, she was a single parent. Um, when we were in junior high, I remember that we were on free lunch and, and, and received some services in that way. And um, I was surprised when I went off to college and was getting dropped off at uh, the dorms and saw some really nice cars in the parking lot. I thought there were some lucky families who had some nice cars and were doing well. I was really surprised when a lot of those cars stayed in the parking lot after everybody went home from dropping their kids. Um, so I was kind of surprised at the wealth that I saw in college. Um, that, that gets ramped up in law school. Um, law school, there's going to be the spouses and children and, and financially successful individuals themselves attending school. Um, and I'd say it's in a higher percentages than in undergraduate experience. And sometimes um, those individuals will kind of drive the spending culture of schools, whether it be things like where everybody goes for a happy hour at the end of the week or how people plan or spend their vacations during spring break or fall break or the, or the winter break, um, where they tend to live or health clubs that they belong to. Um, Keep in mind that uh, it's pretty easy to live a nice lifestyle as a law student. Um, you'll have access to student loans, credit card companies like you because you're, you have earning potential. Um, and so you could basically live life like a lawyer while you're a student. Um, you can belong to some nice health clubs, you can live in a nice apartment complex, you could even drive a nice car. But if you live that lifestyle on loans while you're a student, um, basically living a lawyer, like a lawyer while you're a student, then you will live like a student when you're a lawyer because once school finishes after three years, you have to pay all that money back and that can have a serious impact on your lifestyle. So keep that in mind in terms of uh, frugality and, and um, your approach to the investment that law school is. It's an investment that you want to have um, dividends pay off in the future and some um, and, and waiting for uh, those, those benefits is, is going to pay, pay off in the long run. Second part of strategy. Here's that financing part. Uh, you need to have a three-part plan for your, your budgets. Um, creating that three-part plan is going to have one part, first part dealing with that application, second part dealing with the enrollment, and the third part dealing with that licensing phase. Um, develop budgets for each of those. I'll show you how to do that in the next little bit. Investigate options for funding uh, and know that you're going to have to apply for assistance. And to that end, I think it's helpful to map out a timeline that will incorporate not only your applications to law school, but you also set up a uh, dual track that follows the applications that you need to make for financial aid. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. Compare all costs. Make sure that you're comparing the full costs associated with attending law school and you're incorporating everything into those costs so that when you're making comparisons, you're making um, real comparisons that are comparing apples to apples. Um, consider and have contingency plans. I think the time we're in right now is a perfect example of this. Um, None of us planned for this in, in reality. Uh, we didn't anticipate this, but there are some folks who said if, if something financially hard presents themselves, what will I do? If I lose my scholarship, what will I do? If the spouse that's living with me gets furloughed and isn't uh, earning a salary, what is my plan? Would, you know, do I think about move, transferring schools and moving home and living at the house uh, of my parents to keep costs down? Um, you know, what is my plan B? It's important to have those in place before you start school so that if 
the unfortunate does occur, you're in a position to say, all right, I thought about it. I have a plan in place. I'm going to execute that plan and I'm going to move on. Um, and that's going to give you the best opportunity to maintain, you know, that high level of academic performance and not be distracted at the level of perhaps some of your classmates who didn't anticipate or think about these kinds of contingency plans. And then finally, ask the hard questions of yourself in the law schools as you go through this experience. Um, I'll let you know candidate fees. So these are the 2019-20 candidate fees. Uh, they will be coming out with the 2021 fees. Um, they're going to be making some adjustments to the LSAT, and I don't know if that's going to be affecting the fees, but at least for now, here's the fee structure. Uh, the cost of the LSAT is going to be $200. The credential assembly service is going to be just under $200 at, uh, at $195. For each law school that you apply to, there's a $45 cost for the report that has the information that's submitted as part of this credential assembly service. There are packages that you can purchase from the Law School Admission Council that save you a little bit of money if you're applying to the average number of schools that our people are applying to, which is six. So there's that $650 cost. Know that if you wanted to take the writing sample, again, as part of the process, there's an additional cost associated there. So uh, potential application expenses, as I've shown you on um, that last slide. Uh, there's the LSAT. Uh, there's the credential assembly service with um, one report, which is just the $240. If you want to do the package, it's uh, $650. Then there's law school application fees. Um, uh, we'll be sending you an application fee waiver for our school for uh, logging into this event. So no, and keep an eye out for that. It'll be a code number that you will plug in when you get to the payment page for the application process. Schools do charge application fees, not all, but for those that do charge application fees, the average fee is about $60. Um, so when you add all of that up, you know, your, your fixed expenses in applying to law school are going to run you between 800, roughly $850 to a little over uh, $1,000 or almost $1,100. Um, then there's variable expenses, you know, guidebooks if you want to purchase those. There's LSAT preparation. Then school visits. I have question marks about school visits, deposits, and moving expenses because I don't know about enough about each of you as to, you know, what are your plans in applying to law schools? If, if you're only applying, if you, for example, live in Southern California and you're only applying to Southern California location schools, then the school visits is just, you know, a tank of gas. Uh, you're most likely not going to have to spend the night, not spend the night uh, at, at, in, in the city away from where you live. Uh, and so the cost will be much less expensive in terms of um, the due diligence associated with school visits. However, if you're going to be applying to schools throughout the country, you know, the four corners of the U.S., schools in New England, schools in the far northwest, schools in California, and schools in the south and southwest, um, you're going to have to fly to visit those schools and, 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 you know, have hotel accommodations to put you up for a night, things of that nature. So it's important that to, to incorporate those costs. I'm going to spend a moment on this application expenses because there's some good examples of what I mean by resource acquisition and resource act allocation as it relates to an investment approach to law school. An investment approach to law school doesn't mean doing things as frugally as possible. Um, while I think there should be times in which you want to be conscious of that and be frugal, there are other times where you're going to have to put money into this process. And if you're going to have to do so, it may be, a, there may be a bigger dividend or payoff by putting a little more money into something and the value that you get out of it, um, or how you uh, uh, allocate the resources that you're going to put into it. And uh, an example I like to use is LSAT preparation. So we all know that the LSAT is an important part of the application process, and it probably affects, um, your, and it will affect the schools you gain admission to and the scholarships that you're going to be offered. And so if you're performing at the average without much preparation or you're preparing on your own, and you're performing in that kind of 151, 152 range of the LSAT score, which is the national average, um, if you are the kind of person whose learning style really is really um, benefits from structure, then an LSAT preparation course may be worth the investment in that uh, if you're just preparing on your own and it's hit or miss at the kitchen table when you find time to do it, and sometimes it's late at night, sometimes it's in the middle of, uh, and sometimes it's in the morning, um, but it's not a set thing. I would encourage you to look at your undergraduate experience and see the kinds of classes that you did best in. 
And if it was the kind of class where the instructor, she provided a, a detailed syllabus and followed that syllabus and there was times throughout that, that instruction where you would be tested on your progress in the class and you regularly got feedback and you had a clear idea of where you were going so that by the time you sat for the final exam or did your final paper for the class, you essentially knew what you were gonna get because you had been kind of structured and monitored the whole way. That's essentially what commercial LSAT prep does. And if you benefit from that type of learning environment, it may be worth the investment if it can get you an LSAT score that jumps up three, four, five points, so that if you're going from having a 152 by preparing on your own to say 157 to 159, it's gonna affect the schools that you gain admission to and the kind of scholarships packages you would be offered. And so using this as an example against um, that scholarship information that I presented on that slide. You know, the, the, the average scholarship at, at public schools, I believe, was about $15,000 for the year. Um, the return on investment for your LSAT prep course, that's the way you should look at it, would be if you got into, if without the course you were performing in a way that um, wouldn't get you scholarships, or the scholarships you got were fairly small or below average to what the average scholarship was, that $15,000, then your return on investment would be um, $13,800. You put $1,200 into the LSAT course, but your score improves so that uh, the improvement reflected um, or, or the improvement uh, led to getting that larger scholarship. And so the return on your investment was $13,800 as opposed to um, not putting $1,200 in the process, but not being as competitive. Then the thing that you have to put a value on yourself is, you know, what schools you, you, you're hoping to gain admission to and what is the value of gaining admission to those vis-a-vis uh, -vis that, that investment in LSAT prep. And so as you think about it, you may say, I don't have the money or I really don't want to put this on a credit card, but it may prove beneficial. But the last thing I will say about that is it only proves beneficial if you take full advantage of it. There's nothing magic about just signing up for a course. It's taking the full advantage of the opportunities provided by that course and taking the practice tests and going to class every day and doing the exercises. The other part of the investment is school visits. And this I put as, a, as an analogy to purchasing a home. Um, the average debt for people attending private schools was six figures, right? It's almost $125,000. I think it's helpful to think about it like purchasing a condominium. If you were to buy a small condominium for $126,000, $25,000, first of all, it'd be a deal. But even though it's a deal, would you buy uh, a, a condominium if you were to mortgage that condominium for its full value, $125,000, would you make that purchase just by what you saw on the website for whatever real estate company had it listed? I don't think so. I think for people, if they're going to buy real estate, they're going to go with uh, a real estate agent if they have one, and they're going to walk through the apartment or the condominium and see if everything works, if the toilet flushes, the, the neighborhood that it's located in, because if they have kids, they want to make sure it's got good schools, you know, those kinds of things. That essentially is the school visit part of this process. Um, doing the due diligence of knowing what you're buying uh, in that tuition and debt that you're going to incur, and it can make a world of difference. So it's worth the investment of that walkthrough to make sure you know what you're getting. And, and, and it's not a lost part of the investment is if as a result of a trip, you decide, you know, that school doesn't work for me. That's actually a good sign of uh, money well spent because you're making a more informed decision. So be aware of that. Um, so, uh, Know that in terms of the LSAT cost and the CAS cost, there are fee waivers. So if you haven't already purchased the LSAT or you haven't signed up for your CAS report, um, there is an LSAT fee waiver program where the Law School Admission Council provides waivers of those costs. Um, it is financial. Your eligibility is based on your finances. You'll have to provide tax or employment information. I always say a rule of thumb that tends to work fairly well is if you're a student now and you are currently on a full Pell Grant, chances are you will qualify for this LSAT fee waiver. The nice thing about the LSAT fee waiver is it's not just one LSAT, it's two LSAT. You get two administrations, you get the CAS service, subscription service plus four law school reports. So if you're applied to the average number of law schools, you only have to pay $90 because there's only two school reports that you have to pay for, the other four are covered. 
And then um, know that the Khan Academy is a free test prep. I know I gave you the example of a structured test prep. Um, it can be a good approach, I think, to go online and try the Khan Academy. If you're not an online learner, you may discover that this isn't working out so well, and you may have to invest in that commercial in-person test prep. But there's nothing to lose by trying out the Khan Academy for free. Just make sure you carve out enough time to see if this test preparation works for you. And then if it doesn't, you still have time to register for a class and, and use that class in preparation uh, for a reasonable amount of time before the actual administration of the test. Um, yeah, the Khan Academy can be linked from our website or the Law School Admission Council's website or just do Google search Khan Academy test prep and then LSAT prep, you know, it'll take you to the right part of their uh, website. All right, so that's the first part of um, the uh, financing your law school plan, part one. So part two is the enrollment. Um, how do you pay for law school itself? Uh, first part is you have to figure out what's it going to cost you. You've got to establish your first year and your three-year budgets. So I'll show you how to do that in a minute. Uh, resource acquisition. Get the free money first. That's staying the obvious in many ways. But, but going after that money and then looking at the other resources that are available to you. More on that in a moment. And then know what your borrowing needs. This goes to that kind of piece of fatherly advice I talked about where you shouldn't be living the life as a lawyer while you're a student. And so to that end, um, there's this thing that drives the process for financial aid. If you haven't gone through the finan federal financial aid process, there's this element of it called um, the cost of attendance budget. The cost of attendance budget does a couple of things. One is it lets you legitimately know uh, what the average cost per year of going to a particular school will be. And that's in part because the federal government, which is the... Um, lender of student loans in the Department of Education has rules by which if schools want to participate in that federal student loan program, they have to provide information to the federal government showing they've estimated the cost of attendance using their, their rules or the surveys that they require them to use. And that cost of attendance budget includes these kinds of expenses, tuition and fees, books and supplies, housing and food, the one-time purchase of a computer. If you have children under the age of 13, the, the care, uh, the, the daycare, if, you'll, if you will, um, that those students have to, those children uh, need to have covered while you are in school. This isn't their day-to-day -day living expenses. This is kind of their care while you are in school. Miscellaneous uh, personal expenses for things like clothing, entertainment, uh, that, that sort of thing health insurance, transportation costs, and then the federal loan fees. Uh, 2018, um, not including tuition and fees, the cost of attendance on average for public schools is about $20,000. And at private schools, not including tuition and fees, it was about $24,000. Um, so the, the, the other role, so the cost of attendance, two roles are one, this is how much money you can get from the schools in financial aid that includes scholarships. Um, so that you cannot get more money from the school than what the cost of attendance budget is. And then the second thing, role it plays is it informs you as an applicant of what it's going to cost you to go to school there for the nine month school year. So that's how you put together your budget. You go to the schools and this is where you ask the question and compare all costs. You go to the school and you ask not what is your tuition to compare schools, you ask what is your cost of attendance budget? And with that, you can set your first year budget, and then you just multiply that number by three and add a few percentage points to get an estimate of what it's gonna cost you to go to school for three years. It's gonna be a big number, it's gonna seem scary. Just know that as part of that number, you're gonna be looking at expenses you're gonna incur no matter what, your room and board, for example. So that, that kind of cushions the blow. And even though that number may be kind of scary, at least you have a number to put your hands around and say, all right, as I acquire resources, this is the amount of resources that I need to acquire um, and being able to afford to go to school. And as you put this together, now I want to go through kind of the, the resources you'll want to think about. Uh, the free money, scholarships. Know that there's two types of scholarships out there in general. One is need-based scholarships and the other are merit-based scholarships. Need-based scholarships are awarded um, on a formulaic basis. It's basically what's your cost of attendance, what resources does the school ask you about in terms that you may have uh, access to, um, 
That is information that is provided through the free application for federal student aid or the FAFSA form. So you'll need to complete that, that uh, form. Um, schools for their need-based scholarships can ask for more information, including parental information, um, uh, but they don't have to. And, and a lot of schools will just go off the information on the FAFSA. At the University of Utah's College of Law, we only go for the information on the FAFSA. And if you're receiving additional support, we ask for that on our need-based scholarship application form. So be aware of that. Merit-based scholarships are a little bit more complicated. Uh, for merit-based scholarships, I, uh, I think they fall into two classifications. One is merit on interest scholarships, where you're awarded the scholarships um, as part of your application and admissions process. And then merit scholarships, the second category is merit scholarships for continuing students. And those are the kinds of scholarships that second and third year students will compete for uh, that are scholarships or awards, or they could also be um, uh, income earned as being research assistants or graduate assistants. And often those, those um, compensation packages will include partial or full tuition waivers. So uh, that's part of that realm. On the side of merit on entrance scholarships, those will fall into a couple of categories. One is renewable. Uh, that are, so these are scholarships that are good for three years. Uh, sometimes those scholarships are contingent or have conditions of academic performance to keep them. And others have no conditions that you get to keep the scholarship for three years and all you have to do is not get into academic or behavioral trouble, basically flunk out. Uh, and then there's scholarships for a term where they, you'll be informed that it's a scholarship for one semester or for one year, and then that's it. And if you want additional scholarships, you apply for and compete for them in the second and third years. Always know what the conditions and stipulations are associated with those scholarships. As part of that contingency plan, you have to think about if there is a condition on that scholarship that is a fairly high GPA or class rank associated with that scholarship, um, ask yourself the hard questions how likely is it that I will be performing at that level? Um, and, and you can get that information from the, the 509 reports or from the schools and asking them, uh, what is the median LSAT and GPA of the students who are entering your program? And what is the 25th and 75th percentile of the students who enter? That is, who are the students who are in the, you know, at, the, at that top 25% and their LSATs uh, were that number and higher? Um, and the, the top 25% on GPAs. And you'll have a sense based on your numbers where you're gonna fall within the group. Now, there may be reasons why you can feel that you may be competing more, um, you'll be competing stronger for those even though you're not, not at the numbers because perhaps you come from an engineering major uh, and there's, grade, there's less grade inflation in those majors. Um, uh, your work experience in a particular field uh, makes it uh, likely that you perform well because let's say uh, you were a paralegal for the last five years and your legal writing skills you have confidence in things like that. Um, but regardless of your self-evaluation, it's important that you know kind of statistically where you fall within the conditions of keeping that scholarship and, and having that conversation with yourself in the school about that. Um, diversify your resource portfolio. Uh, just like in investing, you want to have a diverse stock portfolio so that if there's one area or one sector of the economy that goes down, there's other areas or sectors of your stock portfolio that aren't going to suffer because they're in different sectors. Um, so for your resource portfolio, you should have savings that you're turning to to help support yourself. You should be working. Uh, you, sh you can use gifts. There's HR and VA benefits to consider and then the loans. We'll talk about the loans in a moment. In terms of savings, uh, you should always be saving. Uh, between now and the start of school next year, you should be saving and you should have a goal. I think a good goal if, if you're just starting saving now is fifteen to $1,500 to $2,000. If you can go to law school with $1,500 to $2,000 saved, that means you're gonna be able to pay for your books yourself and you don't have to borrow that amount of money at anywhere from six to 8% interest rate over the next three years. So um, that'll be helpful. And then while you're in law school, save a little bit every month so that when you are graduating and you're gonna have expenses associated with getting licensed, you're gonna have a little bit of less, you're gonna have a nest egg to work with to pay for your bar licensing fees or your, else, or your bar uh, preparation course, things of that nature. So savings is an important part of this. And even if it feels like you're just nominally saving money on a monthly basis, over the course of the next 12 months or the next three years, um, saving a little bit every month will add up.
work. A lot of schools have a policy where they don't want their first year students to work and some schools just outright prohibit it. Uh, and that's fine. Um, but know that uh, working while you're in law school, starting with your first year summer after you've completed your first year and throughout, it can be a very helpful part of the job search process. You're going to be networking. You're going to be getting to know more and more lawyers if you have that job in the legal market as a paralegal or a contract attorney or a summer associate. Um, but if you're working, you're going to have resources that you earn from work that are help you keep your student loans down. And then you have connections to build on your networking base uh, for when the job search happens uh, throughout the rest of law school and going into your early career. Gifts. Um, this is, you know, uh, to put it in another word, crowdsourcing. Uh, I had a student a number of years ago who used this idea and, and it was before um, crowdsourcing was a thing, but basically she told me when she started law school, she told everyone in her family and close group of friends that now that she was in law school that she uh, preferred uh, if they, they would not give her traditional gifts for things like birthday or religious holiday, holidays or anniversaries or those sorts of things, but instead just give her a gift card from uh, the campus bookstore or Amazon in whatever amount they, they felt appropriate. And she said between her parents who would give her, you know, pretty sizable gifts for, for, the, for the Christmas holiday and her birthdays and what have you, to her siblings and friends who were smaller gifts, but the circle of friends and family was large enough that she said she never had to pay for her books or, or supplies uh, because she was able to use those gift cards to cover the costs of all of those kinds of things. So I thought that was a great idea and a way to think about it. It's just that you now have technology that works on your side and you can send out emails as graduation comes and you want to notify people that um, there's sort of a registry for you. It's just that you're not, um, you're not having a baby or you're not getting married. It's that you're going off to law school and if they could help support you, um, that you'd be very appreciative of that support in the way of uh, financial gifts. Um, Human resources and VA benefits. For those of you who happen to be in the military or dependents of those in the military, uh, talk about talk to the VA advisor about what resources are available through your GI Bill uh, or any other benefits offered through the VA. Um, for human resources, a couple of pieces of advice or ideas. One is, um, if you happen to be going to law school with a spouse, um, the thing, and you, especially if you are going to be moving to get to your law school, I would encourage you to ask your spouse to look for a job on the campus of where the law school is located because a number of campuses or a number of universities will have policies where their employees will get a tuition break um, once they pass their period of probation and uh, oftentimes that tuition break will can be applied to spouses and dependents. So for example, here at the University of Utah, it's a 50% tuition waiver for employees once they get through their probationary period, which I believe is three months of work. So um, they can start working on their education or graduate school education, uh, perhaps an evening or part time for that. And then just as importantly, after 12 months of employment, I believe, um, the spouse and dependents of the, of the university employee also qualify for the 50% waiver. And so your tuition can be waived, 50% of your tuition can be waived as part of the human resource benefits package of our employees. So um, it's important to ask that of the, the campuses you're looking at and, and encouraging your spouse to take advantage of that. And often there'll be additional benefits like insurance, a good insurance plan, uh, retirement that, that vests very quickly that they can take advantage of. And you may find that can be a huge benefit in, in, in uh, being a part of your resource portfolio and paying for schools. And then there's loans. You need to know your loan options as you go through this. Um, your loan options will include, oh, let me go back to the cost of attendance budget here for a second. As I mentioned, the cost of attendance budget has, covers two things. What it gives you an idea of what it's gonna to cost to go to law school and what you're eligible for in financial aid. And coming up with this cost of attendance budget, know this, these expenses are not allowed. Car uh, payments, uh, support for spouses, 
uh, payment of any other credit card or commercial debt um, that you may have going to law school, and periods of non-enrollment. So it's a nine-month budget. So if uh, what some students will do is summer can be included if you go to summer school. So if that's going to be an issue, you might want to consider whether a school has a summer program that's available to you so that you can be eligible for financial aid in the event that you don't have full-time employment to get you through this summer. And then re relocation. If you're going to be moving to your law school, know that you're going to have to incur those costs yourself. The loan resources uh, or loan options that are available to you as uh, a law student through the federal unsubsidized direct loan program, graduate plus loan program, institutional loans, and private loans. I also often caution people about private loans. Um, they do exist and right now they have some pretty good interest rate. The Fed has a near zero interest rate and you know the private sector loan programs kind of build on that. And so in fact, private educational loans have lower interest rates than the federal loan system. Know this though, those interest rates are variable with no cap and can be readjusted. And if we enter an inflationary cycle, you may find very quickly that your loans become more expensive because the interest rate on those loans go up. Um, to follow the market costs. Secondly, um, private loans don't carry the benefits of federal loans. One of the reasons federal loans have a higher interest rate, there's these benefits associated with it that include cancellation. If you were to become 100% disabled or if you had um, the unfortunate uh, um, occurrence of your, your passing away, uh, loans can be canceled in that event and so your estate doesn't get hit. And then there's options available through the federal loan program, such as uh, public service loan forgiveness, income sensitive repayment plans, and not all the private loan programs have those as options, especially uh, loan forgiveness. There is not public sector loan forgiveness available through the private loan programs. Institutional loans. Those are going to vary from school to school. I don't know much about those because there's so many different colleges and universities out there, but I'd say you, know, you should pay close attention to them if they do offer you institutional loans. Of those that I am aware of, they often will mimic the federal loan programs. It's just that the institution offers those loans um, through its own resources and they, that may work out better for you in terms of, you know, costs or other things associated with, with uh, them being forgiven or being income sensitive in repayment. So definitely look at them, but make those comparisons to the federal programs as you, as you look at interest rates and opportunities. My focus at this point is going to be on the federal loan programs because this is um, the lion's share in, in a very significant way in the types of loans that students are taking out to cover law school. The federal direct unsubsidized loan program is what I call an entitlement program. And what I mean by that is um, you it doesn't take much of anything to qualify for the loan. Basically, you just cannot be in default on a federal student loan. Um, if, uh, if you're not, then you are eligible for up to 20, uh, for $20,500 a year through this special loan, through this loan program. Um, uh, interest does accrue while you're in, in school, but only after the money is divert, dispersed. So you'll get half of it in the fall, half of it in the spring in the disbursement. The disbursement you get in the spring does not start accruing interest until that disbursement date in the spring. Um, one of the things I don't like about the federal loan programs in particular is what they have right now in terms of their interest rate system. It is not a variable system in that it's constantly changing, but the interest rates will vary uh, depending on the year in which you take it out. The interest rate is reset annually for whatever money you borrow in a particular year um, to follow the LIBOR rate uh, with a formula associated with the LIBOR rate. Uh, this money has uh, can go up to 9.5% interest, but it cannot go beyond that. There is a cap. And so for an example, for the students who are graduating in a month, our May 2020 graduates, in their very first year of law school, the 2017-18 school year, the loans that they took out were had a 7% interest rate and the 20,000, oops, and the $20,500 that there was a 6% interest rate and the $20,500 they took out in this year had a 6% interest rate for the life of that loan. So until that loan is paid back, that 20,000 you're paying 6% on. Then in their second year, the money that they borrowed that year had a formula that created an interest rate of 6.59% for that 20,000. So they've got $41,000 they borrowed, uh, 20, 1,500 for the first year was at six, 20,500 in the second year was at 6.59. And then the money they borrowed this year 
was had the interest rate drop back down to six. So that third $20,500 for the life of that loan is going to be at 6%. I really don't like it in terms of it, first of all, being confusing, but it makes it very difficult to really estimate what the life of your, what the cost of your loan is, especially if you elect to take extended repayment, which gives you repayment opportunities or options up to 20 years. And these kinds of little differences over the course of 20 years of interest being paid can make a difference. Um, but this is the system in which we work in and just be aware of it. The second type of loan program that exists is called the Federal Direct Grad Plus Loan Program. Um, it's what I call a bridge loan. And this is the loan that you take out to cover your cost of attendance minus any other scholarships or loans you are receiving. So there's not a numerical cap on this loan and it's a bridge in that um, it covers whatever your cost is gonna be, regardless of which school you choose to go to, minus any other aid you're gonna go to. You're gonna, you're gonna be receiving from the school in, this, in the form of scholarships, loans, and federal work study, if you participate in federal work study programs. Um, like the direct loan program, um, it has an adjustable interest rate depending on the year in which you borrow the money. The cap is a little bit higher and the formula creates a little bit higher interest rate. So the cap is 10.5%. Using the example I just gave, for the people who are graduating this year in their first year of law school, uh, whatever money they borrowed out of the Grad Plus loan program had a 7% interest rate. And then the money they borrowed in their second year jumped up to 7.59. And then this year that money was 7.07%. The other thing that makes this loan program a little bit different is there are private or there are um, credit requirements. They're not as strict as private, uh, but what they're looking at is whether you have an adverse credit history, which basically means are you 90 days or more delinquent, three months delinquent on the repayment of debt. Uh, or if you're in default in debt. Um, if you're 90 days or more delinquent, the thing about the Grad Plus and this definition of um, eligibility, adverse credit his history, you can rehabilitate and become eligible if you contact your lenders and say, look, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll get up to, um, uh, to uh, I'll, I'll make my payments um, so that I, I'm not showing as delinquent and know that you know, now I'm in law school, I'll be able to set up a side some of my, my um, resources to make regular payments. Um, and so you can qualify for this money uh, if you can rehabilitate your, your credit history or you can get a co-signer. Just know that you go through this credit check every year when you borrow this money. So just because you take care of the is issue in your first year doesn't mean you have to, can't re it's not gonna have to be revisited in your second or third year. The other things that will affect your eligibility to borrow this money is whether there is a foreclosure tax lien, wage possession, or write off a title uh, for debt student loans in the past five years. So, so realize that. Um, I haven't seen any questions, so no questions on either the part one or part two of the process. Okay. Um, Licensing and loan repayment. So this is that third year, and it actually looks a bit like uh, that year of applying to law school, except instead of having the LSAT, you have the bar loan. Instead of having application fees for a bunch of different schools, you have your bar application fees and registration fees for the jurisdiction in which you want to sit for the bar. It can get pretty expensive. Registration fees, I say, for bar for sitting for the bar are going to run anywhere from four to six hundred dollars, depending on the jurisdiction. Uh, preparation, you're, it's like, it's like the LSAT prep, you know, 1200 bucks, you know, Kaplan and Barbary are companies that are in the business of bar, commercial bar preparation, their fees run around $1,200. And then there's licensing fees. Um, once you pass the bar, then you have to pay your licensing fees. They're a little bit less expensive than um, attorneys licensing fees. If you, if you're a new attorney, usually for your first three years of practice, your licensing fees are a little bit less. Um, and then they jump up once you're in your fourth or fifth year of practice, they, they jump higher. But even though they're less than what most of the attorneys in the jurisdiction may be paying, license fees still are substantial. Uh, then if you're going to be moving to wherever your job is, if it's not near where the law school that you attended is, um, is located, then you're going to have to move. Living expenses. As I mentioned, if you have, um, if you're living in one of those uh, bar jurisdictions where you don't get um, hired until you're licensed as an attorney, you're gonna have to come up with the expenses to get you through that. Then work expenses. If you can afford it, I always encourage people to, once they have that job, find out what kind of system they have, uh, IT system, and try to find a technology um, 
and, and, and match your home technology to what you have at work. So in situations like the one we're currently in, it's kind of a seamless thing to be able to work from your house because you have the same type of hardware technology at home as you do in your office. Um, and then loan payments. You're going to go into repayment uh, in most cases six months after graduation. The nine months is if uh, you have Perkins loans. Those, those loans have been phased out. I think we're probably going to be in the fifth year of, of it being phased out, so that won't apply anymore. I have a note here saying considering life insurance and bank bankruptcy for people who when I said debt aversion and they said, you know, I'm comfortable with, uh, you know, $200,000 of debt, $300,000 of debt. Um, those are big numbers. Um, know this, uh, as I mentioned or alluded to earlier, the, one of the good things about the federal student loan programs is that you have this benefit that if something unfortunate happened in your life and you happen to pass away or become 100% disabled, those loans can be canceled. The thing about the canceling of those loans is it's great. It makes that debt go away um, and your estate isn't going to be responsible for it or it's not going to be held over your head if you're 100% you're disabled. But that's a decision made by the Department of Education. There's another department in the United States government that comes into play if your debt gets canceled and that is the IRS. The Internal Revenue views student loan debt cancellation as what's called a taxable event. And so they see it as if the government gave you a gift. And if you got a $300,000 gift or a $200,000 gift from the government, if it's $200,000, the tax you would owe on that gift is about $60,000. And if early in your career, you don't have the kind of estate that would cover that kind of taxable debt uh, or that the tax on that, on, on that gift, then it might make sense to have a life insurance plan that has the value of what that would be. You'd be making you know, premium payments that are, are, are fairly reasonable. And if in the event of something unfortunate happening, that would be covered. Your financial, <laughs> um, um, that's my dog. Uh, you, you wouldn't be responsible for that debt. Um, and then as you pay down that debt, you can just, you know, inform the beneficiaries of, of the insurance plan that you know, you'd rather have it go to another into a person or to another resource to support. Um, the other thing is bankruptcy. Uh, loss, uh, stu federal student debt is very difficult to get discharged in bankruptcy. So don't think that one of the things you can do is acquire a huge amount of debt and then just have it right off by filing bankruptcy. Student debt is one of the most difficult items to get discharged in bankruptcy. We should be aware of that. Finally, um, know your repayment options. Uh, repayment falls into two very broad categories. One is payment based on how much debt you have. And that really plays into the kind of debt people mentioned when I told them, what is your debt aversion number? The second kind of category is what's called um, income sensitive or income based repayment. Payment based on your income. It doesn't matter how much you borrowed. The determination of what your monthly loan payments are gonna be is exclusively contingent on what your <laughs> earnings are annually. Um, Sorry about that, it's part of what can help. Uh, in terms of loan repayment that plans based on debt, you have standard, graduated, extended, and fixed and extended graduation, graduated. And those repayment plans will run from standard kind of 10 years up to 25 years on the extended. Um, there's fixed payments on the standard and then graduated and extended graduated have uh, increases in graduated steps as you pay. If you're interested in these, quite frankly, it probably makes more sense to be in the income-based repayment plans because uh, when you do the extended graduated, income that you see increases on get, um, gets absorbed with larger student loan payments. Right? So just be aware of that. A lot of financial advisors I've talked to don't uh, feel that that is the wisest choice on that. Then there are the income-driven repayment plans. These are plans based on your income. That income is based on, as the, the calculation is based on a household's discretionary income. It's not the amount of your debt, it's your discretionary income. And it's like being in the financial aid process though. The payments are adjusted tw every 12 months and, and you have to report what your income and family size is to the Department of, of uh, Education or the, the federal loan processor that you're working with who holds uh, or administers your student debt. So realize that. Um, income loan repayment plans based on income include the repay, revised pay as you earn, 
the payee or pay as you earn plan, which is 10% of discretionary, 10% of discretionary. Um, if you're working in the private sector, there is forgiveness after this time period passes, realize that. Then there's a uh, income-based uh, payment program. It's an older program actually. Um, it's called IBR, it's also 10%. And then another income-based payment uh, that's based on 15% of discretionary income and then the income contingent repayment plans. As I'm listing these, know that the income or the, the repayment options that are available to student loan borrowers are probably the area of legislation, federal legislation that has had the most change in it over time. And uh, even though we're talking about these right now, chances are, especially after having gone through this recession and um, this next general election, uh, these plans are going to change based on federal legislation that will be introduced and passed with a change of administration, uh, whether it's at the House or Senate or the executive level. This is the definition of, of discretionary income. It's based on the federal, federal poverty guidelines, family size, and your state of, uh, of residence, AGI. It's basically very similar across the federal states, except for the states of Alaska and Hawaii. The, uh, and uh, but if you're married, depending on how you file married or single can affect what your payments will be. And I'll cover that in a moment. Under the repay plan, um, you're eligible for the loans that you borrowed that I just described. It's 10% of discretionary fund, but high, it's 10% of all your income. There's not a cap. So as you earn more money, this 10% of discretionary income is going to increase your payments. Uh, which is different from what was called the pay plan. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, there's, forgiveness is longer. It's 25 years rather than 20. The discretionary income includes your spouse's income, regardless of whether you filed taxes separately or as joint filing. And the, the potential for increased interest subsidy while it does go up while you're in repayment. Um, and here's an example of how these two different repayment options actually work. Um, let's say you're a student loan borrower and you have $100,000 of debt, okay? Get back here. Um, if you're in a standard repayment option, which is based on how much debt you have, and you elect to have your loans paid off in a 10-year standard plan, you're going to have a fixed payment, which is the same payment every month over the life of that loan. And the weighted interest rate, let's calculate it at 6.3. If you had 100,000, let's say you had 125,000, let's say you went to private school and you're the average private school borrower. If you had $125,000 of debt, your monthly payment will be $1,400. It's a mortgage, okay? Um, uh, if you are in the income contingent repayment options or income uh, uh, based repayment options, uh, let's say it's the payee or repay, which is 10% of adjusted gross income. It doesn't matter. You could have $125,000 debt. You could have $225,000 debt. It doesn't matter how much debt you have. What matters is your income. If your discretionary income is $50,000, remember what government workers make in the examples I gave you on the, on the, resource, on the research pages? Let's say you're, you're working as a district attorney and you're making $50,000 a year and your household size is just you, you live by yourself. Your monthly loan payment is gonna be $265 a month. So those are two big differences based on the repayment options you have, okay? And it may make working in public sector, if that's your goal and dream, a real possibility. You know, making monthly payments at $265 is manageable. You're not gonna be living completely high on the hog, but you're still gonna be able to have a life where you have a thing called a car and apartment, stuff like that. Um, so those are some of the biggest differences. I'm going to show you that under this repayment estimator, if you go to studentloans.gov, you can get a guesstimate of what your monthly payments will be as you guesstimate what your debt is going to be but using some of the information I've provided to you. So if you've already borrowed financial aid, you're going to already have this a federal financial aid. You'll, you'll already have the login information under the federal student aid pad. So just go to that page, log in. And then go into um, the repayment estimator. Um, and uh, once you go to that page, uh, you should be able to see your profile here. And then you can look at a variety of things. You go to the estimator right there. Okay. 
And once you go in there, you say, what kind of your fight? You know, you're going to be single. You can, this is where you can play with what kind of debt. So if you think you went to private school, you're going to have $125,000 debt. And if you want to include your undergraduate debt, you, you play, you play, you put that in, in. And then there's an option to put the interest rate associated with each of your loans. So you can adjust that to view or add your loans. And then, um, uh, you put your loan balance, then you put your adjusted gross income. So that it allows you to get information on your various loan programs. And then it'll come up with this page where it'll show you the standard repayment plan and what the monthly payments would be, the graduated, the income base, the repay plan. So this is a great way to see, you know, looking to the future under the current repayment options, what kind of debt, uh, you, based on the kind of debt you think you might have, what re your repayment options and costs would be. So um, it's important that in terms of repayment, you also uh, realize like in times like this, under the stimulus bill that was just passed, uh, the federal government are, is giving um, deferment of payment for everybody who's already in pay, repayment at 0% interest. That's only gonna last until September. And then it's the programs that are available in the federal programs, uh, the student loan programs that have deferment or forbearance. And you can, these are safety nets, which mean uh, as long as you report to your servicer a circumstance, if you lost your job or you haven't had the paperwork completed for choosing your repayment option because you're switching to income-based repayment, you can defer or forbear your payments for a period um, and it won't give you a hit on your credit report because this is allowable, all right? So stay in contact with your loan servicer as you go through repayment. So in case you need to take advantage of federally options, federal options in the payments that, that yeah, you, you're, you're doing so under the rules that are outlined in the program. Public service loan for forgiveness. Um, what is it? Uh, for people who want, it's a federal program and for people who want to work in government, any form of government, and they're committed in the long run to that kind of work of there can be tax-free loan forgiveness for any outstanding balance after you make 120 payments on your debt um, in an income sensitive repayment option, as long as that's a qual as long as you are in qualifying public service and you must make payments while you are in this public service. Uh, important details. Uh, two, two conditions must be met, that you're an employee that is uh, in a qualifying public service or organization and that you make on-time payments for the eligible loans that you've taken out. Um, some of the pros of this is it creates the financial feasibility of working in public service because the repayment options require that you be an income sensitive repayment, but you have to be among the, those are among the repayment choices. Um, and if you have a long-term commitment to it, uh, your debt can be forgiven. And um, it's an entitlement, kind of like the direct student loan. Some of the calls, cons in the program right now, however, are that it's an all or nothing benefit, which means you have to meet all 120 months of repayment, which basically is if you go straight through 10 years. They say 120 months because you can take breaks in your repayment. So if you want to take a break to start a family and take family leave, for and, and your um, your circumstances allow for you to take a whole year off, you can leave that qualifying employment, be in forbearance on your debt because you're not employed. And, and uh, since you're unemployed, you don't have to make those payments, um, but interest does accrue. And then when you go back, you start where you left off, but you have to kind of re-register and make sure you're, you're in qualifying employment and you have documentation that shows all of those things. But if you get to, um, your 119th payment and your, your fairy godmother of jobs comes to you and says, I'm giving you your dream job, but you have to leave your current employment right now. And you're not an eligible repayment for that 120th month, then you get no loan forgiveness whatsoever. You have, to, you have to be in it for the full 10 years, 120 months. And there's no prorated forgiveness as part of this. It's only direct loan debt that can be forgiven. So if you have any private debt, that does not count. And the program can be changed by Congress. Um, you know, uh, you would most likely be grandfathered in. Uh, that's usually what has happened in programs like that. But if you're three years old for, play away from applying for law school, there, between now and three years from now, there's a possibility that they change the rules. Uh, it can be changed by legislation. I do want to highlight this uh, 
bit of information that's been out for a little while. Uh, back in um, fall of 2019, um, last fall, there was discussion about the first group of people who qualified for public service loan forgiveness under the program uh, that we just described, it's actually an act called the College Cost Reduction Act, um, that they were getting their request for public service loan forgiveness rejected. And there are high rates of rejection. Um, after further study, it wasn't just kind of this rejection uh, on an arbitrary level. It was basically as they investigated, Part of it, uh, or a big part of this, was the lenders not being in eligible employment, or even if they were in eligible employment, they had switched jobs. So the first job they got out of law school, they reported to the loan servicer. And then when they switched jobs from, say, the attorney general's office to the district attorney's office, they didn't register that change. And so even though they were in eligible employment, they weren't reporting it as part of their, their monthly payments. And then since there wasn't a record of that change that made them ineligible because those months that they didn't report it made that didn't count towards the 120 poor, towards loan forgiveness. So the big lesson here is that you want to make sure that you're documenting and you're doing all the things that you're supposed to, to be eligible at the end of the 120 payments. So there was denials going on, but the percentage of those that were being rejected were largely due to, to record keeping issues or not following eligibility rules for the borrowers. So it's important to keep informed. As I've already alluded to, things will be changing in part because of what we're in right now in COVID and all the, the legislations that are the, that's being passed associated with student loans, but also the election year. Uh, we expect a lot of legislation to start happening um, after the election, depending on which party is going to be in power. And so make sure your voice is heard as a student. I hope you found this very helpful. Uh, my recommendations as you contemplate doing this are that you not be passive. Uh, hopefully I've impressed upon you the need to have a three-part plan. It's a little bit complicated, uh, but you're going to law school. You can do this. You just need to think well and not act without some very serious thought. As I alluded to, I have a number, uh, or I will be sending out the, the deck, the slide deck from the presentation that I just gave uh, to everybody who attended. So. I hope you found it informative and there will be some websites and links to these websites uh, that have additional information either about some of the things that I alluded to or talked about in my presentation, but also some, inf some helpful information, especially in the area of public interest and then documented student resources. I'm happy to hang out for a little bit online if uh, people want to submit questions or feel free to shoot me an email or give me a call on my cell. As I mentioned, my cell number is 801-913-9055. And um, let me take you. Oh, there's a, I left that, so I'm sorry. 801, uh, so that first slide on the slide deck will have my um, address, my email address. So with that, um, don't have any questions that showed up on the Q&A. If you do have any questions in the future, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Please stay safe. Please stay healthy. Uh, we'll get through this whole COVID thing. Uh, hope to see your applications in the future. And I wish you the best for those of you who are students with the rest of your semester. Have a good evening. <laughs>